Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's book talk about a guest at the Shooter's Banquet. My name is Sydney Yeager, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Now in its 24th year, the museum is committed to the crucial mission of educating our diverse community about Jewish life and heritage before, during, and after the Holocaust. As part of that mission, our programs illuminate the stories of survivors, broader histories of hate and anti-Semitism, and stories of resistance against injustice. Um, thank you for joining us today over Zoom, um, but we hope that you'll visit the museum in person if you are able to, to see our new core exhibition, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, alongside our temporary exhibitions, Boris Lurie, Nothing to Do But to Try, running through November 6th, and Survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust from, photog from photographer, excuse me, Martin Scholler, which opens on September 18th. You can purchase tickets on the museum's website, mjhnyc.org. We also invite you to get closer to the museum by becoming a member. Members enjoy exclusive programs, member previews to exhibitions, and unlimited free admission on every visit, all while providing vital support to the museum. You can explore membership at mghnyc.org slash membership or email membership at mghnyc.org to learn more. Closed captions are available on today's program um, and instructions on how to turn captions on or off are posted in the chat in addition to all the links I've mentioned. Uh, today, we are honored to be joined by Rita Gavis and uh, Lima Vince. Vince, excuse me. Rita is an award-winning poet, essayist, and prose writer. Her work has been featured in Harvard Review, Guernica, Poetry Magazine, and elsewhere. Her memoir, A Guest at the Shooter's Banquet, was included in Kirkus's 2015 Top 10 Nonfiction Books of the Year. She has taught creative writing at Hunter College in New York City and is a founding member of the New York Writers Workshop at the Upper West Side JCC. She's currently at work on a novel. Lima graduated from Rutgers University with a BA in English and German Literature and then earned an MFA in Writing from Columbia University School of the Arts, an MFA in Nonfiction from the University of New Hampshire, and in 2022 defended her dissertation Memory and Postmemory in the Writing of North American Writers of Lithuanian Descent, earning a PhD in Humanities from Vilnius University. She is the recipient of two Fulbright grants in creative writing, a National Endowment for the Arts Grant in Literature, and a Penn Translation Fund grant, among other honors. She wrote the introductory essay to The Unlocked Diary and translated into English from Lithuanian the diary and poetry of Litvak poet Matilda Okunaite. Um, she has also written an analysis of the memoir Painted in Words by Holocaust survivor Samuel Bach, which was published by Pucker Gallery as Catharsis Through Memory. Um, before we go any further, I want to tell you a little bit about the book. Rita comes from a family of Eastern European Jews and Lithuanian Catholics. She was close to her Catholic grandfather as a child, but as an adult, discovered an unthinkable dimension to her family's story. From 1941 to 1943, her grandfather had been the chief of police under Gestapo leadership in a Lithuanian town near Polygon, where 8,000 Jews were murdered in three days in 1941. In 1942, the local Polish population was also hunted down. Her exploration into this truth of who her grandfather was and what he had done resulted in her memoir, A Guest at the Shooter's Banquet. Built around interviews from four countries and filled with original scholarship, the book documents the Holocaust by bullets and chronicles Gavis's journey to learn all she could about her grandfather. You can buy A Guest at the Shooter's Banquet through Amazon, which will be linked in the Zoom chat. If you have questions for our speakers during the program, please put them in the Zoom Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the hour. So now after all that, thank you so much for joining us today. And I'm now gonna hand things over to Rita and Lima. Thank you very much, Sydney, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you very much to the, Jewish, the Museum of Jewish Heritage for inviting me today as a, a moderator. And thank you, Rita. Uh, Gabe is also for um, inviting me. So I'd really like to just dive in and, and get into some of these questions. And um, so perhaps not everybody has read the book, but I think that, that Sydney's overview gives a good sense of um, the structure and the theme of this work of nonfiction. So I'd like to ask Rita, um, let's start at the beginning. Tell me about what, what it was that initially motivated you to write this book, to embark on a journey of five years of research, interviews, and intensive 
travel to Lithuania, to Israel. Um, well, what was it? Where, where, did the, where does the story begin? Well, that's a great question. And I, I, I want to, before I answer it, just say, um, you know, many thanks to the museum for inviting me and also to you, Lima um, and Sydney for moderating. Um, so where did it all start? Um, as Sydney said at the beginning, I come from a, a mixed family, um, half Lithuanian Catholic, half Jewish. Um, and, you know, when I was very young, some things were said to me by my Lithu Lithuanian Catholic grandfather, who I knew well as a child, um, that I didn't really, they didn't really resonate as I, I, I was, I was too young to take them in and understand them. But for example, uh, when I was about seven years old, he was visiting us for the summer on Martha's Vineyard. And um, he took me aside and he said, don't be like your father in his um, broken English. And I love my father. And I said, why not? And he um, said, Jews, no good, which, you know, I, I took in. Um, as soon as another adult came around the corner of the porch, we were sitting, my grandfather stopped talking about it. But years later, it would come to haunt me. Um, and that's just one example of things that stuck out and stuck with me as I moved from adolescence to adulthood. Um, I knew that in, in, in terms of the narrative for my Lithuanian Catholic family, my uncle, I mean, my, sorry, my, my gr grandfather was a hero. He had um, led his sister and his children to safety um, as the war was ending, the Germans were being routed and the Russians, the Soviets at the time were moving in. And so he was a savior. Um, his wife, just to add this in as part of the equation had been swept up during Stalin's purges, arrested as many people were just prior to World War II, Jews and, and non-Jews alike and was in the gulag um, during the whole course of the war and after for many, many years. Uh, but aside from being a hero, I, I, I had a conversation with my mother. Um, we were in New York City, we were sitting across the table at a cafe and I said to her, so aside from rescuing the family, what else did my grandfather do during the war? And she paused and she took a sip of her coffee and she said, well, he was a policeman. And I pondered that for a second. And I said, do you mean under the SS? And she said, well, I guess so. And I just remember, you know, my heart was racing and um, my hands were all sweaty and I was trying to take this in. And I realized very quickly, I had no thought of a book in mind, but I realized that I needed to find out as much as I could about what had actually occurred during my grandfather's life in wartime. Um, as I said, I had known him as a child, I had loved him, uh, but now there was new information and I just felt compelled to chase it. Okay, thank you for that response. So what exactly was your grandfather's role in the Holocaust? Um, and what were you looking for when you started this journey and what did you find? So I, I can't say that I was looking for anything in particular because I, you know, certainly I hoped I would not find that he had been responsible for any deaths, um, uh, any persecution. Um, we don't want any of our close uh, relatives to uh, be a party to that. So I wasn't hoping to find the worst about him. I just wanted to find out, you know, I didn't know a lot about collaboration at that point. Um, it turned out he had been chief of security police, a member of the Salgumas, which was um, really the most brutal collaborationist arm of the uh, Lithuanians who joined up with um, the Gestapo, the SS, um, to do some of their dirty work, to do their bidding. And he had accepted a job and he was um, really an intelligence gatherer. And of course, 
because of the nature of war, he became other things as well. You know, roles were not um, really contained unless you were in a very low, low rank, and then it was very defined what you could and could not do. That was not the case um, with my grandfather. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so in your book, you write about a moment in which your thinking about the past shifted. This occurred during a conversation with Jonathan Boyerin from the University of Carolina at Chapel Hill, who translated from Yiddish into English Holocaust survivor testimonies recorded after the war in the displaced persons camps in Germany by a Holocaust survivor from Kovno named Lieb Konichowski. Byron said to you, quote, history is by nature retrospective. We give order to it as it were orderly. But the people who lived it or died during it, there was nothing retrospective about their experiences, about what they thought would come next, how they interpreted, for instance, a day of brutality. How could they know the way we know what would follow? End of quote. So reflecting back on this quote, I'd like to ask you, how did your journey change along the way? And how did your process, and how did the process of changing the book, of writing the book, change you? Well, first of all, I'm so glad you brought up that a part of the conversation that I had um, with Boyar. And I mean, it, it was, it was a moment that really did alter my whole sense of history and also my sense of my own purpose. You know, we like things to be neat. We like things to um, come in doses that we can kind of absorb, understand, catalog. And I just wanna throw in, you know, we're talking about a time when there were not, um, you know, uh, where there wasn't Facebook, where there weren't cell phones, where as we're seeing in other parts of the country of, of the world, Ukraine in particular, um, events being captured in real time. I'm not sure that that's depicting exactly the reality on the ground. It's in snippets. So it's still not the same as being there. But what Boyarin said really made me understand or helped me understand the answer to a fundamental question, which I had read, which had been postulated about, um, was a subject of many dissertations. You know, why did the Jews of Lithuania, why did the Litvaks not leave? At the first sign of brutality, um, when there was still a possible way to get out, when it was not yet completely impossible to get papers, for instance, why did they not all just pick up and take off? And um, one of the things that quote helped me to, helped me to think about was the fact that you know people cannot predict the future; they do not know what's going to happen next. And I think one of the unfortunate results of the way we have looked at history especially say Litvak history, is this notion of, you know, the sheep going to the slaughter, as if there was no fighting back, as if there was no attempt to resist. And that's simply not true. There was a tremendous amount of resistance. Um, and there was fighting, you know, the, the survivors who I interviewed were all partisans. They had acted against, um, not uh, the, the German occupation to the best that they were able and they had survived. Um, it makes me understand and I hope it, it helps others to understand that when you are in the middle of, you know, a, a whirlwind, you do not know when it's going to stop, how long it's going to go on. If it happens suddenly, you do not know in advance how to prepare yourself what measures you should take. And if you're talking about people who are, and that's one of the tragedies we're seeing right now uh, happening in Ukraine and have been seeing happen for months. Although again, I'm not comparing 
Ukraine to the Holocaust. And let me just get that straight. But, um, you know, people were loath to leave the life they knew and had known um, for generations in their family. And so to have this prescience that, oh, bad things are gonna happen, we're going to be slaughtered. We have to gather our belongings now and, and depart the country as quickly as we can. Who thinks like that? You know, we don't think that way in our own lives. You know, that's, that's such an excellent point because what comes to mind is Samuel Bach's memoir, um, Painted in Words, and there's a scene where he's a child, he's about eight, nine years old, and is right at the very beginning of the German occupation of Lithuania. And some friends knock on their apartment door and they said, we're escaping, we're running, come with us. And um, his mother says, no, I'm not going anywhere. This is my home, I haven't done anything wrong. Right. Um, of course, they end up in um, the Vilna ghetto, they have two escapes, they're sheltered by, uh, Benedictine nuns, they, they, they survive, but um, Samuel Bach loses his father, both sets of grandparents and extended family. And he writes about how for many years afterwards in the DP camp in Germany and in Israel, his mother would bring up that moment and have that conversation and say, oh, why didn't I listen to those people? Why didn't I go? What's wrong with me? Why didn't I? And um, and he makes that point that, well, how could she have just left the home she'd known for many generations? So it's just, a, it's like, a, kind of like that scene reminded me of what, what you, were say, you, you were saying. You mentioned Ukraine. And so I'd like to ask um, the following question. One of the first sites Russia bombed in Ukraine in the early weeks of Russia's invasion of Ukraine was Babi Yar, the Holocaust Remembrance Site. President Zelensky, who is Jewish and whose relatives were killed in the Holocaust, said at the time of the bombing, quote, what is the point of saying never again for 80 years if the world stays silent when a bomb drops on the same site of Babi Yar, end of quote. Russia has attempted to justify its invasion of Ukraine by telling the world that they are fighting quote unquote Nazis. As a Jewish American and as a writer, how do you feel about this rhetoric? Well, first of all, I'm just going to dip back in for a moment to my Lithuanian grandfather. Um, he did some horrible things that I, documented very carefully because the last thing I wanted to do was write a book in which there was speculation. If I didn't know something, I said I didn't know it. Um, he was not a Nazi. He um, did not even ascribe to the Nazi party in any way. What he did do was carry a deep-seated hatred of Jews who he unilaterally declared we're all communists. So this is an example of uh, a misuse of a historical term, applying it to a population and using it in the most punitive way um, possible, using it as an excuse. Um, and he carried that hatred with him when he was able to ultimately immigrate to the United States. What we see Putin doing is taking this word Nazi and really defiling history um, by claiming, and of course, this has been written about and spoken about um, by people, historians who are much more knowledgeable than I am uh, since the war began, um, you know, that perversion of language used to support an idea that will somehow prop up a brutal incursion against a democratic country. You know, not only does it completely ameliorate the reality of the Holocaust 
And a large part of the people who were the perpetrators, who were members of a fascist party, and who were creating um, and giving orders and making extermination plans beyond just the pit shootings that we now know so much about. Um, you know, that perversion of taking a, a word and divorcing it from meaning is terrifying to me. We've seen it happen in our own country. You know, for that to be able to happen, it means that truth itself is in grave jeopardy. You know, and, and there have been many stories coming out of Ukraine of, you know, the soldiers who are coming into attack saying something like, well, you're all Nazis anyway, you know, which is ludicrous. And, and what does that even mean? It doesn't have a historical meaning. It doesn't have a real context. All it has is, you know, uh, uh, a fascist's um, reasoning to give to his people for what is, as we know, a horrific war. Um, so I'm appalled by it. I'm appalled by the way that it happens in this country. And I think we have to be, it, it makes historical accuracy and a fidelity to lang the language of history that much more important. Yeah, I completely agree. I keep completely agree. And, and as a poet, you are well versed in the precision of language. And that's, and that's one aspect of your book that is really apparent is that precision around um, language. I'd also, I'd like to ask you about the process of interviewing survivors and their families, because one of the strengths of this book is that you include interviews with uh, people who survived the Holocaust, whose lives were affected by your grandfather's um, actions and also their family members. And so I wanted to ask you, how did you find a way to have a deep conversation with victims of extreme historical trauma? Um, how did you go about having these conversations? And um, did you worry about this process of going back into such a traumatic past? Did you worry about that re-traumatizing these people? And many of them are already in their 70s and 80s at the time that you interviewed them. So if you could talk a little bit about the process of interviewing. Absolutely. I, I just want to say, and again, I'm referring to your last question, just to say in terms of creating a book like this, Everything changes once you're on the ground in the actual country where certain things happen. So it's much, much different than doing research from afar. So let me just say that. Um, the Really, the well-being of those I interviewed was my first priority always. Um, you know, it was interesting because I was looking um, as hard as I could with some assistance for survivors from the Svencionis ghetto, and of which there were very few. And I looked and I looked and I got some tips and it turned out that the first person I interviewed, Haya Pilevsky, who's now no longer with us, unfortunately, lived in the Bronx. So as a New Yorker, it turned out she lived an Uber ride away from me. Um, she's an example of someone you know, who willingly, although I said, I, I should say with some reluctance, shared her, her long, complicated and difficult story with me. And I'm so grateful to her and her family members. Um, and certainly at every point I offered to stop. Um, you know, my objective beyond, way beyond gathering information was to allow the person who I was interviewing to be in control of the interview. 
And so um, even if they did not ask to stop, if they seemed tired, if they seemed overwhelmed, et cetera, I would find a way to cut that day's conversation short. Um, Yitzhak Arad, who is someone else who survived the um, Spencianus ghetto, who lived in Israel for many years, who just recently passed away, um, who I came to know very well, and certainly as a historian, his books were a great help to me. Um, I wrote to him thinking that he, at a certain point, he was coming to the States a lot to give talks. And I, and I said, you know, I, I'm hopeful that maybe one day I can interview you when you come to the United States. And he emailed me back and he said, I'm ready to talk, come to Israel. So that's what I did more than one time. And as a historian, you know, he'd already told his story in, in an amazing book called The Partisan. Um, he was, it wasn't that it wasn't traumatic for him, but he was somewhat used to relaying the events in his life and, and the life of his family um, in Lithuania, in Svensionis, during the occupation, during the time my grandfather was chief of police there. There were other people, local people in Lithuania who, you know, just by luck and word of mouth and so forth, I I was able to connect with and, you know, everyone was willing to talk, but I had to be very careful because, you know, I remember one woman who was probably in her 80s when we spoke, who had been a near witness to the Polygon massacre, where the 8,000 Jews from the entire area, not just from Svencionis, but from all the surrounding towns, over a period of two days were shot. Um, and my book, the title of my book, A Guest at the Shooter's Banquet, actually comes from the fact that in many towns after these shootings, there would be banquets for the shooters. And my grandfather was a guest at the banquet for the Polygon shooters. Um, but anyway, this woman who had not witnessed the shooting, but had been out collecting firewood and began to see the march of people going by, um, the shooters getting ready, you know, just hearing the rumble of trucks, et cetera, and then going out again and hearing the shooting just started weeping uncontrollably. After all these years, as we were having our conversation, which I ended at that point. So, um, and that's not the only time that I stopped an interview because it seemed as if um, whether the person wanted to keep talking or not, it was too taxing for them. And I would always check in during the interview. Um, how are you doing? You, know, you find ways to ask people, um, do they wanna keep on speaking? Do they not? Are there things they would rather not talk about or things they would like to talk about? So you have to be very, very careful because trauma lives forever, you know, somewhere inside those who have experienced it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very true, very sensitive response. Um, during your trips to Lithuania, you visited four family groups. These were your own relatives um, and you visited them during the course of your, your research. How did your Lithuanian family over here in Lithuania, I'm in Lithuania right now, um, your Catholic Lithuanian family, how did they react to your work on this book and to what you learned about the grandfather? What did they know about him? And um, had they also heard the, the hero narrative? Um, you know, you had been separated by the Atlantic Ocean and many years, so. So how, what was their reaction to your work? So it was much more accepting than that of the, my Lithuanian American family, I have to say. Um, I saved those visits for the last year of my research. I made many trips to Lithuania and to other countries. And um, I made those family visits on my last trip 
for research purposes. There were four different family groups. Two of them had been really persecuted by the Soviets because they were looking for my grandfather and he had fled. And in those days, if they couldn't get the person they were after, they went after their family. And one family group had been sent to a logging camp in Siberia for a number of years. Um, another group had been routinely harassed um, in the most brutal ways, you know, uh, um, intelligence officers coming to their house in the middle of the night, pulling them all out of bed, telling them they were going to be shot, you know, this going on and on for a number of years, actually. They couldn't, they wouldn't have told them where my, uh, grandfather was. And in truth, I don't think some of them even knew um, where he was. They, they were to uh, a person, they did not champion my grandfather in the way that my Lithuanian American family did. Okay. Nor did they, um, you know, despise him for having brought upon their families um, such punishment, you know, in his absence. Um, they were neutral in a sense. And um, they were, I think in part because of what they had gone through, they really believed in the freedom to explore to find out. And, and I remember one wonderful, um, he would be probably my third cousin, um, family member. And at each family group I went to, there was a huge feast. So by the end of the, that trip, that, that day of visiting, I was stuffed to the gills, but you've got to eat to be polite. Um, and he said to me, you know, the truth will be what the truth will be. And we'll see what it was. And later I saw him several years later, he was quoted in a magazine as saying, yes, you know, Pronus Pronus, my grandfather was a collaborator and this is what um, we've learned and it's true. So why deny it? Um, the one thing they told me, a curious detail that my grandfather had sworn to them that he had never stolen from the Jews, which was really one offense a Lithuanian collaborator could get in a great deal of trouble um, over, but mostly from the uh, from the Germans who were in the town because if there were spoils to be had, they were the ones who wanted it. But my grandfather's insistence about it really made me wonder just in the back of my mind, you know, uh, you know, maybe he's insisting on this because he actually did. And that's one of the reasons why supposedly he was going to be sent up to a court uh, and punished for stealing from, you know, uh, good Soviet citizens. Um, so they were wonderful, I have to say. They were embracing. And I explained to each um, of them, each group, what I what what I was doing, and they were very open-minded. That, that's a wonderful discovery that you made. And, and in fact, you, you, you um, mentioned that article and what your um, relative said about Pramas Purlonis. And uh, I read a magazine article in Lithuanian that was about collaborators and, and, um, and uh, the German occupation. And your relative is actually quoted as saying, um, my own father was a farmer and um, did not serve the, the Nazis and the Germans, and that was his choice. However, my uncle chose to um, serve the, <clears throat> the occupying forces. And he made that, that distinction that there was a choice, which I found very interesting. I mean, it was, it was very interesting. Go ahead, I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> Excuse me. No, and I think that that he came to that thinking through your work and your research and what you were able to share with the family. The, the, one of the great ironies in what you just said is that, um, you know, my grandfather, he ended up in a DP camp. His children were there and his 
the, the first place that he wanted to go to from Germany where the camp was, um, was Canada. And I think he believed that he would have a lesser chance of being prosecuted there for war crimes. As it turned out, um, Kennedy rejected him, but the US would let him in. And even so in the camp, he was questioned several times on his papers that he were necessary in order to apply um, to be allowed to immigrate. He said he was a farmer during the war. <laughs> Which is a little bit of projection there. <laughs> right, which of course was not true, but that's the that's the um excuse that he used. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember a friend of mine who's a historian, um, and she actually has done quite a bit of research on the Holocaust in Lithuania, and she does educational programs. And she told me a story that her grandfather during the German occupation some men came to him and said, you know, come and help us shoot the Jewish people in, um, in the forest. And he closed the door and he quickly woke up his wife and his child, grabbed some clothing, some food, and they escaped through the back door. And they spent the four years of the uh, German occupation living in hiding, going from one relative's farm to another and sleeping in the forest to avoid being um, called to that kind of duty that he didn't want to do. And this friend of mine, she stressed, she said, there was always a choice. And not well, to believe when people say there isn't a choice. Well, I would say this. I mean, in my Lithuanian American family, the notion was if my grandfather had done anything wrong, he had no choice. But in fact, people did, some people did have choices. Um, and some people didn't. For some people, you know, it was give us your cart to use or drive the cart um, to the middle of town so we can load up the soon to be shooting victims, show up with a cart or we'll come and kill you and your family. I mean, that certainly happened. Um, but for others, there was a choice. I mean, my grandfather, even before he was given this position, was um working as a or, or acting as a kind of functionary on behalf of um you know the lithuanian um partisans or white bands whatever you want to call them who were kind of running rampant uh before there was some sort of order in place um through the occupying forces through you know the actual occupation um, on, by, by the Germans. And he was already, you know, uh, people were bringing him communist Jews and he was um, giving the nod for their death sentences. And this was even before he got his job. So clearly he had some kind of agenda already. Um, and, you know, the real gun to his head came uh, when the Germans were being routed and the Russians were or the Soviets were coming in. Um, and he, you know, I mean, there's one, there's one antidote that always sticks out for me, which is that during the time he was chief of security police, my grandfather had one of those motorcycles with a sidecar, which I'm sure he bought or won at poker, you know, from some German soldier, officer, whatever. It was a BMW. And um before he uh, left Lithuania, he buried it. He had mm -hmm. to come with a digger and he buried it because he loved it so much and he thought he would probably come back to the country one day. And so, you know, it, it's just a small example of a perk, if you want to call it, um, that, he, that he got and that he enjoyed during his time. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, Rita, how did your Jewish American family react to your book and the work that you were doing? What were some of their feelings? Well, it's interesting because, you know, there was always distance between the two sides of the family. And um, the older I got, the more I realized how profound that distance was. 
when I spoke to um, one of my elderly Jewish relatives who um, I think is probably listening now and uh, maybe does not want to be quoted. So I'll, I'll, I, I'll just, I'll quote her anyway, but I called her and I said, you know, I'm doing research on my grandfather. And she said, well, we all knew he was a Nazi, which A, wasn't true. He wasn't a Nazi, but there was a notion that, you know, these Lithuanian Americans who are coming in, who are immigrating, um, have been part of the decimation uh, Eastern European Jewry, and that's just how it was. And you know, also they, uh, the Jewish side of my family, picked up on. I'm sure, um, you know, he was a rampant. My grandfather was a rampant anti-Semite, as was his son, and even his uh, one of his daughters, though in a much more coded way. Um, and they knew that about him. They were less surprised than other family members. Okay. Um, I would just like to wrap up with one last question then we're going to go to our listeners um, questions that have been coming in over chat. But one thing that I found fascinating about your book is how you bring in the unconscious and this intuitive unconscious sense of knowing and um, at one point when you keep coming up against dead ends in your research you called it ghost knowledge or haunt knowledge the sense of knowing and not being able to prove it also there are quite a few scenes in the book in fact the very beginning of the book opens with dream sequences with your own um, dreams that haunted you since childhood which one is of being pursued and the other is of of perpetrating a murder against someone else. Um, and then later in the book, um, you're visiting with your mother and your aunt and they start talking about their dreams and their dreams are remarkably similar to your own. So there's this strong theme going, working throughout the book of dreams and of, of this knowing and unknowing that comes from the dream world. Could you say a few words about that? Well, first of all, um, my mother and her sister their dreams were really trauma dreams from having lived through a war um, that had taken them into hiding, that had brought them close to, you know, um, you know, bombing, repeated bombings. They were always being moved from one farm to another. And, um, you know, they went on the run and, uh, you know, their, their dreams were about the sounds of the bombing, losing their mother, you know, where they didn't know she'd been arrested um, by the Soviets uh, for several months um, until after uh, she was gone. And so they were not dreaming so much about being perpetrators of something. Um, I think that in every family, there's a kind of intuitive wheel that turns mm -hmm. and sometimes it's it's you know it's over exaggerated in a way that's probably the wrong word you know too much stock is put in that but oftentimes it's just below the surface it's those things in a family lineage or even in you know interactions in in the in the here and now with a particular set of family members in which you know, something is known, but it can't yet be articulated. And so sometimes it shows up in dream life. You know, um, you know, I wouldn't have begun this journey with my uh, research and ultimately with the book because of a dream, but the dreams that I had as a child began to make more sense as I began to work on the book. Yeah. I see, so it's like the, the conscious and the unconscious kind of merged right. together. Well, I'd like to now move um, to our viewers' questions. Um, so here's the first question. How is the Holocaust viewed in Lithuania today? Is there education about it and, and the country's role in the Holocaust? So there is education about it. 
I should say that um, as my book was being published and then after my book came out, uh, other people started writing about, um, you know, family members who had been collaborators um, with the Germans uh, and doing their own research and bringing that to light. I think that um, it's still a tenuous, um, I don't even want to say argument, but um, part of Lithuanian history. You know, I think that they have moved out of, and I say they as a country, they're really individuals who are no longer so wedded to this idea that we were the victims, we were the only victims. And yes, 95% of the Jewish population was killed, but, you know, look what the Russians did to us. Um, you know, that is starting to shift, especially with the younger generation. Um, you probably know a lot more about this, Lima, than I do because you're there a lot. I do think there's a change. Do I think there's enough of a change? No. I also think that um, what is happening in Ukraine is having a profound effect, obviously, on the Lithuanian psyche right now and um, what they're worried about how they're viewing history and um, how they're viewing the future. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, the next question, can you clarify how old you were when your grandfather died? So uh, my grandfather died when I was 16. Okay. So I, you know, he was a part of my life for many years. I mean, at, at some point as he got older, um, you know, he became infirm. So it was harder to actually have a real relationship with him. But um, yeah, he was there and he was a part of the family group, as was his wife, who ended up back in the United States after she finished her sentence from the Gulag. Okay. All right. Um, can you talk a bit about how it feels to deal with such a dark family history and how it has affected you? Well, I think uh, that's a great question. I think that um, I've always felt and I feel today that um, the darkness in my family history is nothing compared to uh, the darkness uh, that so many people in Lithuania, so many lit box um, suffered, you know, um, having, having been privy to so many stories, so many family stories of survivors, um, you know, thoughts about myself and the darkness of my family um, feel less important. I do feel like um, I followed, you know, I pursued well, what I can only call as a transitional truth because who knows where more records are, where, where they might appear about my grandfather, that, that I did the best I could and I found it. And that doesn't relieve me of uh, the nature of my family, but it did give me a sense of bringing something to light. And just um, not that I could make right anything that he did, but to be able to do this in honor of, um, there's one young woman, for instance, that's featured in my book, young Jewish girl, um, to honor her gave me a certain amount of solace. Yeah. Okay. Um, did your grandfather ever face any legal action? He did not. And the reason why, I mean, I, I ended up speaking to someone in the Justice Department who had been um, involved in persecuting um, 
people from that time period uh, because of their war crimes in regard to Jewish communities. And my grandfather had slipped entirely under the radar. A, of course, he had lied on his papers, but B, he presented himself as someone who had a great knowledge of communist activity and communist activity in Eastern Europe. And that's really what uh, the United States was interested in. They were far more interested in getting intelligence um, about that than they were in you know, grabbing up someone who was a minor part or a cog in the wheel of the machinery um, that was decimating the Jewish population in Eastern Europe. So that's one of the reasons why he was never um, found out. Wow. He slipped through the cracks. Okay, next question. Do you have any resources you recommend to learn more about the Holocaust in Lithuania? Absolutely. Um, so I would start with The Partisan by Yitzhak Arad, which is, an amazing account of his time, both before uh, the German occupation, but also uh, when he is trapped in the ghetto in Svencionis where my grandfather worked and then chronicles his, his escape. And in doing so also talks about the larger context of what was going on in that country. So I would suggest his book, I would suggest Timothy Snyder's book, um, I'm blanking out, Lima, help me. Um, um, Black Earth. Black Earth, um, not because it focuses primarily on Lithuania, but because it gives a really provocative and interesting overview of um, what happened during the Holocaust before and after, and especially um, delves into this notion of death by shooting. Uh, and amplifies it in a way that I think is really critical. Um, and then I would say, you know, the Lieb Konaszewski's translations, which you can find um, at the, you know, in, in archives in different places, I found mine in New York, are firsthand accounts um, by members of the community who survived, escaped. Some of them were written, uh, before they were killed, but they document these lost communities that will never again be, you know, they're gone. Um, and so he brings individuals to life and it's the narratives of individual after individual. If, if I can just jump in, I would also recommend reading the diary and poetry of Matilda Olkinaita. She was 19 years old when um, she was killed by Lithuanian white armbanders, people from her own small town. And um, I researched her story and um, wrote about it. And um, don't hide any of the facts. Don't sweep anything under the rug about the fact that she was killed um, by her own countrymen because she was she was a Litvak because she wrote her poetry in Lithuanian. She had gone to Lithuanian schools. And um, so her this book, it's called The Unlocked Diary in English. And it's you can order it from the Institute of Lithuanian Literature. Wonderful. One one more. Okay, here's another question for you. Do you have any advice for someone who wants to do research about their family? Yes. So first of all, depending on what kind of research you want to do, if you have family members who are elderly and um, you want to get their stories, get them now as soon as you can. Um, don't wait. And that's one way to begin. The other way is to uh, make a list of questions for yourself about things that you might want to know. And then under those lists of questions, begin to research the archives that might have information for you. Maybe there are archives at you know, um, the Holocaust Museum. 
maybe their archives, um, depending again on your uh, on the on the on what kind of history you want to do. You know, I spent a lot of time on um, uh, what is that genealogical site called? That was the, in the early days. You know, le not legacy.com, but um, the place where everyone went to find out about their distant relatives. I, I'm sure the audience knows. Ancestry.com. Thank you so much. It's been many years since I visited them, but I actually poured over that and they have an amazing amount of information. So that was one of my starting points. And um, then finding people outside your family group who might know something about a place where a family member lived, about a time frame that you're very curious about, and tracking them down and asking them if they would mind answering some questions. Don't be afraid to reach out to people, really. I mean, so many folks helped me with this book, and the generosity was really incredible. Um, and that was in the United States and in Germany and in Israel and in Poland and in Lithuania. So um, there's kind of a global network out there of people who are happy to assist you. Um, be, be as specific as you can. That helps a lot. Yeah. Thank you. And, and if you have roots in Lithuania, um, there's a number of Lithuanian websites now that have birth certificates and and, and all sorts of records. Um, okay, so we have one last question and then we're going to um, pass the baton on to Sydney, who's going to say a few closing remarks. So the last question is, how did your parents meet and was there tension between your parents due to your grandfather? My parents met when my mother was an adjunct student who spoke very little English at the University of Chicago. She was registering for night classes and my father who was on his way to getting his PhD was at the registration table. And that's how they met. Um, I think that in later years, my, you know, my father was, was fairly secular, but that changed for him as he got older. And at that point, I think that it became um, not a source of irritation, but really a, a kind of distancing began to occur between them because his Judaism became more and more important to him. Mm -hmm. And obviously it, you know, it was foreign to my mother. So. Well, thank you, Rita. Thank you for being so open hearted and sharing so much about your family and your work and, and this process that you went through um, spending many years researching this book and then, and then actually writing the book. And um, I do recommend to all of you, if you have not yet read A Guest at the Shooter's Banquet, I highly recommend it. I hope you'll go out and get the book and start reading. 